Dog Boy, Den of Thieves by Bill Meeks. Available now on the Amazon Kindle, iBooks, at CreateSpace, or for the Barnes & Noble Nook. And find out more at dogboyadventures.com. Hey, everybody. It's Roberto Villegas. I know you're normally used to seeing me do my usual podcast shtick and all that fun stuff, but today I'm doing something very special. I am interviewing my good, good friend, Mr. Bill Meeks, accomplished published author of Dog Boy, and I forget the rest of the Guild of Thieves part. <laughs> Den of Thieves. Den of, Den of Thieves. Thank he you. He fights the Guild of Thieves. That's what it is. The book is Den of Thieves. Which, he hands okay, but before we even get into the interview proper, um, I recently just finished the book, and I gotta ask something really, really quick. Okay. Is it just me, or was there? And and, and I, I apologize if there's anything spoilery. I'm, I'm gonna try my best to keep down the spoilery stuff and, and, and keep it down to a very bare minimum. But if I do get a little out there, people, I apologize in advance. I'm just doing this because I read the book and I finally get. To, I, it's rare that I get to talk to an author first and foremost, and it's rare that I get to talk to an author who I just finished reading a book. And it's even more rare that I get to have a friend who's author. In fact, I only have like <laughs> two. Maybe if you count Brian, I have like three friends who are authors. Uh, you, Brian, and my good friend Mario, and that's about it. So it's rare that I get to go. Yeah, what, what was this, this symbolism? What does this mean? What does that mean? So, mm -hmm. the opening question I'll ask specifically on the book that I need to get out of my my head: Is it just me, or was there like an anonymous, like, parallel to the Guild of Thieves at certain points? Oh, definitely, definitely. <laughs> uh, it, it, it was it was very influenced by a, a little uh, by anonymous and also also by uh, some, kind of some of the fringe parts of uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement. I I mean we'll probably talk a little bit about the history of the project and it, I, it's been brewing for several years. The inception of the Guild of Thieves happened, you know, several years ago when the story uh, was created. The initial plot was created. But I, I definitely, uh, throughout the course of writing the novel, took a lot of inspiration from Anonymous, a couple of other little fringe hacker groups online, <laughs> and, uh, a, a, you know, the Occupy Wall Street movement for, for, for a lot of uh, the wording and the recruitment techniques, things like that. Yeah, well, that's actually not, you know, we'll, we'll, let's, well, we're going to table all that. I, just, I had to get it out of my system now because mm -hmm. it just popped in my head as I was looking at the book. But let's actually kind of go back in time. Let's go back. You said this obviously has been brewing, brewing in your head for a while. Mm -hmm. When did you get the idea to do the whole, you know, I'm going to make a superhero book for kids, for lack of better words, or for young adults, I should say? Mm -hmm. Well, you see, that is a fairly recent development in the, in the epic story of... Uh, okay, well, let's go further back. Was there a point in time mm -hmm. that you were... Like, when did you make the... Okay, let's first and foremost say, when did you get the idea for Dog Boy? Like, when did this come up in the, in the idea of, like, was it just, you know what, I really want to make a superhero book, or was it that, you know what, I've had this I idea... Like, where did this all just stay? Was it just in, in your interest in comics, or was there simply mm -hmm. something else that, like, triggered it? Well, I mean, definitely uh, a lot of my interest in comics uh, was involved, but it started uh, about 10 years ago, I think, in May. Uh, it w I wrote a short story uh, for uh, one of my writing classes in college called Primitive Hearts, okay. uh, where, where basically a, uh, a kid named Wiley Esperanza uh, gets a cheap mask and uh, ties a sheet around his neck right, and goes right. around his neighborhood fighting crime. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I really enjoyed the concept and everything of kind of like this... Uh, a uh, kid who wanted to be a superhero, but uh, didn't have, you know, necessarily the skills to put the whole package together, but went ahead and did it anyway and came up with kind of a crappy version of a superhero. <laughs> and uh, then I, about a uh, year later, something like that, Marvel uh, opened up a line of comics called Epic Comics, which was indie, and they had open submission. So I took the short story and I rewrote it as a comic book script. Uh, uh, same basic plot, suburban kid, you know, going around the neighborhood fighting crime. And uh, I, I sent it in and, you know, we had some meetings and stuff like that. And uh, they, they, they basically gave me a little bit of money and they had a, an option on it or an option to develop right. it uh, for a little bit. And it passed. They didn't do anything with it. It came back to me. And I was into screenwriting by that point. I, out in L I was out in L.A. working as a script reader at Acme Literary, uh, you know, doing coverage and stuff for screenplays. Right, right, right. And uh, trying to make my own way as a screenwriter. And I decided to go ahead and take this dog boy concept and kind of flesh it out into a full story. Right. And I, I, 
So uh, basically, I wrote a screenplay uh, from it, which is the basic story from the book. Uh, but I, the book is a lot more detailed, and I, th I think a lot better, honestly, because, you know, I have seven or eight years more well, yeah, you have well, you, well, even in a book, you have more time to do things that you don't necessarily mm -hmm. get in the script, especially when it comes to developing a character. And since you are essentially doing what everybody has to do when they make their, their first their superhero, and every comic book writer seems to do no matter what, even though they're using an existing hero, is essentially make the origin story. Uh, and, yeah. and and you did it in a very interesting way. Like it's rare that um, when it comes to these sort of stories, that I will see the origin story involved. I mean, yes, there's certain tropes that happen, and and we won't get into all those details because that would be a bit spoilerific. Um, mm -hmm. But it's interesting to see. Sometimes you're tilting the trope on its side and and, and doing something different with it. Um, specifically with Dog Boy and, and sort of how, because you don't start with him as like, oh, at birth he's this. Like you start with him pretty much at, at the age we see him at. Like you don't, you don't go too far in. And even when it comes to his origin story, there's not like a whole lot of lag time. There's not like like with the Bruce Rant Wayne where his parents die as he's a kid and then he's an adult, he becomes Batman. This is more of, you know, this action happens and now he's Dog Boy. And sort of, you know, the same age group. And that, that was it always going to be a kid, or was it was there some point where it's going to be someone a little bit older or a little bit more mature? I, I actually, uh, you know, from the original concept, I did age him up a bit. He was originally eleven years old, and I, in in the book now he's thirteen. By the next uh, story, he'll be fourteen. Okay, uh, <laughs> but. Uh, you know, I always thought thought it would be a good idea for it to be a kid, and I, I definitely, you know, I, I made a concerted effort to kind of get the entire origin story and get him in the suit uh, in his first uh, outing against an adversary w within the first few chapters. Okay, and, uh, so it was always your, your point to make sure that mm -hmm. some type of... Because that was the one thing I did, I did notice that, I, again, if... For those who are kind of curious about Dog Boy, to kind of give it, in fact, maybe we should give a, a spiel of what Dog Boy is, because I, I know some of the guys who are listening either on on since this will kind of be one of those very rare simul bro simultaneous broadcast podcasts, both on <laughs> on Bill Meeks's uh, Dog Boy, uh, po uh, I guess podcast, lack of better words, and of course, Eight yeah. Life, my conversational interview podcast. Give a quick, you know, elevator pitch. Like, let's say I'm on the elevator, right? It's you and I, man, and I'm like. Uh, you know, I've been hearing about this dog boy thing. I've been hearing about this book. I mean, I'm saying, and you're like, oh, yeah, I wrote this book. I go, really? You wrote a dog boy? Well, what the heck is it about? Okay, well, I would, I would of course, start off with the this meets that uh, comparisons. It's Oliver Twist meets Stanley Spider-Man or okay. Hardy Boys meets Kick-Ass. I'm in. <laughs> I'm still in. Please. Go on. Okay. 13-year-old kid, Bronson Black, moves to Colta City after his parents die. He's left to his uh, mischievous, mysterious Uncle Randolph. And he uh, comes uh, from, you know, small town to a big city, fights crime, works at a magic shop, and kind of tries to find himself as he fights the Guild of Thieves, a subterranean uh, group that is trying to take over the city. Which, by the way, I won't say... You know any spoilers, but man, Uncle Randolph was a dick. I'm sorry <laughs> yeah. if, that, if that's gonna get bleeped on, on the on the clean podcast, but I know that there is great. no other way to describe that guy. Like, mm -hmm. and, and and he was like rough from the minute. Which what what gave, uh, drew you to do the whole like Cinderella approach to that character? I mean, I know why in the end what happens and and mm -hmm. and things like that. But why go so much like the, the, the ugly, you know, the ugly aunt or the ugly uncle in this case, just like the, like the, the mean stepmother almost figure with, with uh, Uncle Randolph? Like what, was it just personal, was there something personal in your life that did it or was it you needed something to push a character along? Well, I mean, obviously, uh, you, you always bring your personal experiences into whatever you write. I, the, the cruel was there an uncle that touched you? <laughs> I'm just there kidding. was not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but no, the cruelty uh, of Uncle Randolph and stuff, uh, you know, it definitely sourced from various authority figures and stuff I've had in my life. And uh, I, I definitely, I, I could, I, I knew I could write it well because one, I knew what it was like to be a kid in those kind of situations where someone's not being nice to you. Plus, I, I thought, and, and you know, it, it, it would be getting a little spoilery towards the end and stuff, but he definitely... Uh, it, 
there was a reason he was being. Oh a yeah, and, jerk. and you see that in the mean. end, and it's just, mm-hmm. it was just wow. It was like, like hi, I'm I'm Uncle Randolph. Pleasure to see you, boy. <laughs> then we get back back home, and it, it, it is all it is like mm-hmm. one step above just a back slap every moment. Like it is, it is you know Cinderella, Cinderella, night and day, Cinderella, mm-hmm. except you know replace Cinderella with uh, Bronson. Um, yeah. And it was like it was such a almost heart heart wrenching kind of thing. Because there'd be points in in there mm-hmm. that you would kind of feel for the kid just being kind of put in that situation of not being able to really do anything. And there's even a point in time where where you know where he said almost says something and like it slips because he's just at that point like completely fed up. Mm-hmm. And and even then that no one really hears him. And it's like wow, that would just like just be the worst thing on the planet. Just to be this kid stuck in this kind of terrible situation, we should probably kind of phase back a bit and ask why, why the dog motif? Like why, why, why that first and foremost? So there's a couple of motifs in the book that I, I do have questions on. One of them being dog boy. I mean, obviously we've had many other uh, animal inspired, um, you know, uh, I guess it's superheroes, Batman from the DC world, Spider Man, obviously. Yeah. Than an animal, but you know, some type of form of, of non human inspiration. Where did the dog one come from? Like, was there more to it than simply just a name, or you know? Well, honestly, I, have, have you ever seen the uh, interview, the, the taped interview that they released uh, where Kevin Smith sits down in a comic shop with Stan Lee and talks yeah. about the creation of all the Marvel superheroes? Yep. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, well, St- Stan Lee was talking about, you know, all those various characters that have like an animal or an insect in their name. And he was like, you know, Spider-Man just really popped, you know. And uh, I-, I thought, well, if I was 11 years old, what would I think would be really, really cool and sound really ferocious and really intimidating? And it would be like dog boy. Well, it would be dog man, but I'm a boy. <laughs> so it might dog. have to be dog boy. And yeah, that's a, you know, a, a lot of... Uh, the the practical stuff that uh, Dog Boy does as a superhero, I, I I basically tried to work it to be just like a really crappy version. I th- that would be good enough for uh, you know a thirteen year old just trying to be a superhero. Well, yeah. the thing is that you 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 give him some interesting concepts. I mean, beyond just the dog idea of that, it's there's the magic involved. Mm-hmm. There's a little bit of, of of supernatural magic involved. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I I've been saying magic. there's I've been saying saying there's Harry Houdini and Harry Potter magic. Well, because there is, but I mean, even even certain other things are involved. Like at what point um, before kind of things kick off, uh, Bronson interacts with a cup with a bunch of kids who are doing who are essentially you know roll you know you know almost essentially roof running or, or doing some weird things. Like, what are you guys doing there? And they go, we're doing parkour. He's like, what's parkour? Mm-hmm. And it kind of goes into that and, and puts that in, which I thought was really kind of cool because it's, when always it comes to like your superhero things, like I always think of the Spider-Man movie um, that came out, you kind of see them playing with their powers, but you don't see them like, oh, and, and like, like, like it's such a weird, it's always a montage and like in five minutes, in like, you know, in the span of an hour at the most, they're, they're already, you know, whipping across, you know, New York and doing other things like that. But what I liked about Dog Boy is that a we saw where he kind of got his his that that superhero movement down. Which if you were to put in the real world, yeah, that would be parkour. There's no there's no ands or buts about it. And then when you see him kind of doing that, executing on it, you know, he scrapes up a bit, and hurts himself for the first time go around, but eventually kind of gets into it. And mm-hmm. it's it adds again a weird, uh, interesting kind of thing. This also kind of leads into another concept. Why the magic motif? I mean, and, and, and it's and I say that as as a funny part because I was I was reading the book. Uh, there's a point in the book, and I, I got to mention this now because it's something that I laughed at, and I only laughed at because I think I know where you got the inspiration from. Where we see Bronson in a magic store, and the guy is explaining a deck to a deck of cards to him, and it's a Svengali deck. And I'm laughing because, like, I was literally helping Brian a couple days ago, and I packed a lot of those decks. I'm like, I bet you, Brian, I bet you, Bill got this. It was inspired from Brian on this one. Well, see, actually, I, I oh, you, no. you know, you're you're talking about our friend Brian Brushwood, right, uh, right. But but it, it actually wasn't inspired by Brian. They where the magic, the, the Harry okay. Houdini magic came in. My my father, and uh, this is something that uh, some people might not know. He was actually a magician. 
Oh wow, I didn't. Uh, know that. Yeah, yeah, he was a circus magician. Uh, okay. I, I, I've heard he worked for Ringling Brothers, but I've also heard that that he might have just worked for like a touring carnival. Uh, it's kind of unclear. But uh, I- I- anyway, so he was a magician, and when I was a kid, uh, he left me a, a black suitcase, or left us a black satchel with a bunch of magic tricks in it. Right. I, 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 among the tricks, uh, flash paper and uh, a couple of other things that make an appearance in the trunk that Bronson gets. And right. that's basically uh, where I got the idea, because, w- uh, okay, um, real <laughs> life inspiration time. Yeah. I, the, the, okay, is, uh, this is really embarrassing, but I'm going to go ahead and tell it because I've, I've been thinking I, I have to tell this. <laughs> uh, basically, when I was eight years old, I... You went on... Okay, but this is... I, let, me, let me see where this is going to go. Mm-hmm. When you were eight years old, you were not just simply Bill Meeks. Mm-hmm. You were Bill the Magnificent. Uh, I don't think I called myself <laughs> Bill Magnificent, but... Okay, so I took... My my dad, uh, you know, he he passed away before I was born, but he left us this uh, trunk with, or this bag with magic tricks in it. Right. And when I I I might not have been eight, I might have been like eight or nine, ten somewhere in there. I can't remember exactly. But we lived down in Katy, Texas, and I there were these boys at the uh, basketball court who who wouldn't let me play basketball with them, and it, it, they were older boys. It kind of, of burned me a little, right? And uh, so that day I, I went back and I got like a piece of fabric that my mom had in her sewing kit, cut some eye holes in it, tied and made like a really bad Zorro mask with like fringes <laughs> everywhere and everything <laughs> and tied a cape on and then snuck out in the middle of the night and went down to the basketball court with the bag of tricks like flash paper and stuff to try and scare the boys. And they, they were actually down there. They were like 14, 15 year old boys. They were down there smoking, <laughs> playing basketball and stuff right. like that. And they chased me off. And they, they, that, I mean, it's a very anticlimactic end to the thing, but it was my first time sneaking out, you know, in the middle of the night. At least you didn't get your ass kicked. Let's just say that. At least you didn't get yourself hurt. Yeah, it, it, at least it wasn't like Bronson in the beginning. But, yeah, it's like <laughs> you're, you're taking some insp- but the thing is, you are right. You're taking some inspiration from, I mean, every author always pulls from the real life, no matter what they say. Mm-hmm. And, and hearing that kind of story then really solidifies why certain things were the way they were. I mean, the book opens up with Bronson getting the snot being out of him by a bully, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, happens in life, and that's, that's it's terrible. Uh, but what I like about it, what I do like about the demo, again, what I love about the book itself, uh, if I, you know, again, granted, I'm, it's a demo's not my demographic. It's definitely made for young adults, and the language is, is chosen, which is not a bad thing. It's just, that's what it is. But what I enjoy about it, um, from a that kind of perspective, is that there is essentially two, you know, forms of thought in the book. Um, and, and this won't spoil anything. This this one because this is the first couple of pages. Uh, but there's a point where Bronson says his, his father, um, I guess I just wasn't lucky enough or something like that. And Bronson's like, hold on, son. We we what do, what do we what do we say? You know, we don't. We, there is no such thing as luck. We make our own. The idea that you make your own path, you do your own thing, you are, you know, whatever faults happen in the world are your own. Mm-hmm. Flip on, on the flip side, we have the Guild of Thieves, which, not to, you know, say too much, but already talking about the idea of Anonymous, at one point we see the um, main villain, Andros, which I kept thinking of Star Fox with the whole thing. Sorry. <laughs> I kept thinking, like, Andros' enemy is my enemy. Um, not that. I'm being I'm being jokingly because that just kept running my head. Um, <laughs> but the thing he says at one point when he's talking to his sort of flock, for lack of better words, he goes on to say something along the lines of, "Up there, they have ruined everything. They have you know squandered that, and they are the evil dregs of that." In other words, the idea that somebody else is to blame for my problem versus we've made our own problems, deal with it kind of thing. And I, and I, I, I dug that a lot. Was that, was that the idea to make sure Dog Boy had this sort of ethical code? Of, I mean, obviously it probably was, but was it purposeful when, when you have... Like, like, I guess here's the question. Did you come up with the, the hero first and then try to figure out a villain that makes sense for that hero? Or did you come up with the hero and villain simultaneously? Or was it just some other kind of process? Because, I mean, the villain is, like I said, it is... Almost, it is pretty much the mirror image to our, our hero. And granted, that's usually the case, mm-hmm. but 
like, how did you come up with that idea of, it, of, of an Andros and the Guild of Thieves? Was it just the first thing that came to mind? Was there something else, you know, solidifying that? Well, uh, from, a, from a philosophical uh, standpoint, what you're talking about, the whole uh, we make our own luck line that uh, shows right. up a couple times and, you know, is one of the big lessons uh, Bronson's yeah. dad leaves him with before he's out. Um, I guess well, in, that's fair to say because uh, it's on the back of the book. Yeah, his parents <laughs> die in the first couple okay. chapters. I've been, trying to, I've been trying to avoid, like, going too in-depth of, like, <laughs> well, this happened in this book yeah. and, oh, principal is, is this guy and – you know, watch out for this so-and-so and and Cindy here. I mean, anyways, (laughs) try to to avoid things like that. Yeah, but anyways... the, the we make our own luck thing, it, it was really uh, pretty much a situation. Uh, it, when I wrote the original screenplay, I, I was uh, 20, I, 24, 25. I had just, uh, well, I had moved to Philadelphia and then Los Angeles all within the course of a little over a year. Right. And I, I was trying to figure out my way in the world. And I was realizing how many people just kind of projected or like blamed other people for their problems. And I I was kind of trying to come to terms with that and trying to figure out where I was with that whole concept of fate versus, you know, controlling your own destiny. Uh, Philosophically, I was, I was at that point in my head. So it shows up a lot in the script. Uh, As far as like a practical, how I came up with Andrus and the Guild of Thieves. uh, Basically I was in Philadelphia. I was working on the script and I was writing the R100 in from, uh, or out to Bryn Mawr. Uh, which is where my girlfriend at the time lived. And we got st- stuck in the subway tunnel. And right. I noticed like this weird little back way going back through with work lights and stuff. And I was listening to uh, an REM song. I can't remember what it was called, but it was talking about like underground and all this okay, stuff. I was about well, this you, you weren't listening to Shiny Happy People. <laughs> no, no. But and to give you an idea of, uh, about uh, wh- where I was in the story uh, or breaking the story for the screenplay when this happened, it, it was a uh, rate around when I was writing the scene with the cowboy in the parking garage. The chapter is actually called Cowboy in the Parking Garage. Right, right. Uh, and I was tr- trying to think of uh, some, th- some sort of solid, you know, philosophical idea I could have Dogboy fighting against. And I was in the subway and we got stopped and I saw the service tunnel and I was like, wouldn't it be cool if there was like a whole so- secret society back there? And uh, they, that, that's where the idea came from. And actually, uh, a lot of like the environment and stuff of their hideout down in the subway tunnels uh, came from, uh, I read a couple of really good articles over the past couple of years about uh, the underground uh, societies that have built up in Las Vegas, the homeless, the groups of uh, yeah, yeah. people who, who take up in the sewers and stuff like that. And there's actually, there's a pretty uh, monumental chapter uh, that involves a flood yeah. uh, through, through the guild's uh, hideout. And that was uh, directly inspired by an event that happened in Los Angeles. Oh, interesting! Wow, I mean, where, where a lot of those was, people got flushed. That was out also pretty killed. pretty hor- horrifying at times. Uh, kind of going back to the book thing. This is also something that bugged me that I, I, I feel I need to ask now. Uh, for those who have not started reading the book, you will notice this right off the bat. And maybe it's not. I got to first make sure uh, because I'll, I'll be honest. I got an advanced version of the book. I, I, I have before everyone got it because Bill's like. How did like, you get yeah. it leaked? I don't know. I, I know. I, I I may know the author of the book, and he may have wanted me to do this whole interview thing. And, you know, <laughs> things may have been planned because if you happen to listen to the last episode of this whole podcast or whatever, you might have heard it mentioned. Um, but anyways, in each one of the uh, chapters I had, now let me make sure this is actually in the official version. Were the summary title headers also in um, the full version as well, where it says like what's going to happen in the chapters? Yeah. Oh, definitely, definitely. That was uh, – I, when I first read it, I almost thought, like, this was done by accident. I'm not even going to lie. Because, uh, granted, it doesn't spoil everything. It doesn't give you that. It gives you sort of a taste of what's going to happen. Out of curiosity, why do that? Because that's one thing – and very few authors mm-hmm. – like, authors will do something before that. They'll put a quote in or they'll do something yeah. else. It's rare that they'll give you, here's what you need to know for this chapter. Mm-hmm. Is there, like, a reason for that or was it just yeah. – you know, and uh, what you're talking about is basically at the front of every chapter, there's uh, basically one short fragmented sentence for yeah. every scene in the chapter, kind of a summary of what happens in it. And the reason I did that was I, I was kind of operating on the, the idea of doing like a comic book cover. Because, you know, on a comic book cover, you get a pretty good idea of what's going to happen in the yeah. comic, but it's enticing and it's exciting. And uh, to be quite honest, I also... I lifted it um, from a book called uh, It's Superman by Tom DeHaven. The comic book uh, uh, 
idea, the comic book cover idea is my own, but I lifted the, uh, the practice of it uh, from right, Superman right. by Tom DeHaven. Although I guess it's, uh, it was used in uh, Around the World in 80 Days and a few other uh, classic. It, it was used more back in the past. Right, right, of course. But I just thought it was a really good, like when I was reading the It's Superman book, I really enjoyed them because, you know, if I was getting really bored with the chapter or something, I could just flip ahead and I could look at those summaries and I could be like, oh, wait a second, there's going to be giant robots in the next chapter. I have to keep going. And it was well, also kind of cool just to s skip around and kind of get an idea of where the story was going to go to kind of help you appreciate the journey a little more. Too. Well, yeah, no, it was interesting because, again, it wouldn't give away everything. Like, it, wasn't, mm -hmm. it, it was like a, not even a cliff notes because it didn't give off any, like, the major, like, like the thematics or anything like that. It wasn't like, and then this, and Dog Boy learns a valuable lesson on, on cruelty or something like that. <laughs> or, you know, and Dog Boy betrays his, his, his former lover or something. Which doesn't have the book former at all. Former lover, wow. There is no former lover. Um, but... It does get, it did, it was kind of like a little, little jarring not, not at first because I, I wasn't used to it. I was like, oh, I hope Bill didn't, like, I hope Bill wasn't, you know, this was just for that. But then I got used to it and kind of got like, okay, there's the summary. I would, and, and only personally, just because I didn't want to have anything more spoiled, I would kind of just slightly glance over it and glance quickly back down the page because I, I wanted to keep reading. Uh, and there were other points, what I also liked about the book was that sometimes when it came to some of the characters' backstories, that weren't Dog Boy proper, that weren't in the main thread. I liked how they were um, sort of introduced. Like one of the um, Guild of Thieves members that I, that I adore, that I kind of hope gets his own like way cooler. Like 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 if you if ever if ever there's a side story or if anyone wants to make that fan fiction story, that's just really 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 like if this is the young adult version. This is like the the R rated you know William not William S Burroughs, but just like the crazy violent version. I want to see Osborne in something else. Oh, uh, Osborne! I really got Osborne. I love that guy. He was he uh, Os. For those who have not read the book, uh, I don't want to spoil too much with this, but Osborne's sort of this. Um, think of like the most gentlemanly English guy, <laughs> like like the gentleman thief. And what I like about who is a demolitions expert, like I want to see this guy. Like he, like, and the funny thing is. I just got done like watching uh, recently again Ocean's Eleven, and, and I already had that in my head a Basher and things like that. I really want to see an Osbert book. I really want to see this guy like where you know because I, I, the way the way you kind of introduce the backstory is it's as if we found his autobiography lying on the ground. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, he he's he's writing his autobiography. Right, of course. It's, but it's, it's like he found it in the ground, and, and it's like who the heck was this guy? And I like that that was the way you transitioned to him. Um, because it was just sort of like, oh, that's weird, but I like this. Uh, I kind of want to hear more of his story. Like, out of all the villains, I would love to hear more of his 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 adventures and exploits prior to meeting Dog Boy and prior to sort of getting where we are now. Because I can imagine him just getting unhinged. Is, is it wrong for me? To, I mean, I, again, you're the author. You're the one that that knows this. But there's a part of me that that because he was so reserved as a, as a villain. Again, he's not even a main villain. But because he wasn't... He's like a henchman. Out, right. But because he wasn't outspoken, but because he reserved himself, there was that air of mystery that I was like, this guy is someone you don't want to screw with. This is somebody that if, if he was calling the shots, things would be even crazier. <laughs> and I don't know, but he, he gave me a little, not a joker kind of thing, but he was... Mm -hmm. you, you'd see that he'd be, again, it, it, like everybody would be like, I'll pulverize him, I'll do this. Oh, young chap. Um, look, you don't want to do that because if not, I'm going to, you know... Um, Blooded you to a you know a, a pulp like he 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 would he would kill you, but he yeah. would do it in such a polite and posh way that you're like you know what I died, I, I, I look I died to a gentleman so you you would have to admire the craftsmanship of exactly <laughs> like and, and, and speaking of that like how did you get the inspiration for a lot of your guild your your guild of thieves uh, people I mean because you know a guild implies there are multiple people we won't go into saying all the names where I just said one because I really dug the character but we have a, you know sort of a cowboy-esque figure at one point we have uh, Blaze the Cowboy yeah Blaze the Cowboy which I like the name uh, we have um, let's see we have was it Hot John was it Hot John or Hot John Hot John yeah, yeah. Hot John uh, we have, of course, Andros, the main leader. We've got uh, Osbert, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I think got a female there as well. But I can't yeah, remember. Sister Francine. Or Thank just you. Francine. Uh, right. Actually, if you, look at the, uh, if you look at the cover art here, oh, you can no. see right here, Francine was here. 
Oh, that's awesome. I did not notice that. I, again, I had the, the digital version. So I, didn't, I, I had the book. Mm-hmm. I don't think I had the cover even at that Yeah, point. Uh, we should mention the cover, too, done by a wonderful uh, British artist named Paul uh, Loudon. He, he also just did, I guess, for a magazine over there, uh, a portrait of Rocket Raccoon from Guardians oh, of the Galaxy. Wow. No, he like he did a great job. Like like the the artwork is fantastic, and 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 again, I'm 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 trying not to spoil things. I know I'm going a little bit more now because it's, we're getting towards the 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 meat of this sort of thing. And, and anyways, back to so we have a whole cast of characters in, in the Guild of Thieves. How did you come up with sort of? I mean, obviously you have your main villain Andros and and what he represents and things like that. How did you come up with the ensemble that that, that goes with them? Was it just you, you just because it wasn't? There are some that would follow tropes. Mm-hmm. But not, but you even had justifications for it. Like even with Blaze, you justified why he was a cowboy in yeah. like the middle of, of essentially you know you know ur- an urban setting that there would be no cowboy in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, actually, the justification for that was named after a friend of ours. Uh, he, he 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 was an employee at a theme park called Curly World. <laughs> and, uh, yep. <clears throat> But uh, and, and you know he he got fired, but he kept the costume. Basically. Right, which is like the which is like the that's what people do sometimes. Like, well, I got mm-hmm. fired, I guess I made the costume. But like, how does yeah. and so like, but how did you get to the point where like, like you had mm-hmm. was it that the, that when you got your main villain, did you just go, all right, I'm gonna pick the most ridiculous things I can think of mm-hmm. because who cares? Or was there a certain like thematic reason why you had you know well, these cast of characters? Really, again, it, it it goes back to the kind of source material because a lot a lot of the feeling, especially for the first half of the book, I tried to source from Stan, specifically Stan Lee's first fifty issues or so of The Amazing Spider-Man, kind of like that feeling of like, oh, you see Peter Parker go and put his book bag on the roof when he goes down to deal with stuff in a secret identity, right, so right. his costume doesn't get found. All that kind of like practical minutia of superherodom I kind of, kind of tried to source so I wanted to kind of uh, take some inspiration for that from that from the villains too and the the main henchmen uh, Hot John Osbert and uh, Blaze the cowboy uh, were kind of modeled on uh, I, I believe they're called the enforcers okay which, uh, Fancy Dan and I, I can't the other two escape me but there were there was a there was a fighter uh, like a big bruiser fighter right, right. A tactical fighter and then so, sort of like the leader guy, the smart leader guy. Right. And uh, so I, I kind of worked in those archetypes uh, to create the main uh, grouping. And then Sister Francine actually uh, came about because one, after I did the first draft of the book, I realized that, you know, I didn't really have any good uh, dog boy adventures in there that weren't directly tied into the plot like as far as dog boy's journey through the plot. And I kind of wanted to do a really fun adventure in there. And so I, I wrote the, the scene. Uh, there's a scene. Uh, Dog Boy works at a magic shop called the Old Curiosity Shop. Right. And uh, one day when he's working, uh, Sister Francine from the Guild comes in and, uh, and holds up the store, basically. Yeah. And, and uh, so basically I, cre- I created Sister Francine as, you know, just a generic Guild member. But actually, I, I, and I won't spoil it, uh, but... She actually ends up being a, a major factor in a decision Dog Boy makes about yep. uh, midway through the book. <laughs> to... Yeah, pretty much, and it's, it, it 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 sort of uh, influences. This also brings up another question, especially on Dog Boy. Um, mm-hmm. Why throwing knives? Was why there... throwing knives? I mean, beyond the fact they're cool, but I only said it because mm-hmm. it's. There's so many. Uh, I mean, it, I guess that makes sense with a magic motif, but like, you, there there are so many other thrown projectiles you could have used or, or anything else, and especially when it when you finally get to the culmination of all every, everything at the end, mm-hmm. the throwing knives almost seem kind of uh, <laughs> redundant, useless. You kind of, sort of. Yeah. That's I think a folk proper way of saying it. Yeah, so, and, and yeah, they, I, I don't take that negatively at all. I completely understand what you're saying. And if you get to the end of the book, you'll understand what he's saying, too. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm, 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 I'm dancing around with, with, mm-hmm. with, with adverbs and pronouns and, 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 and other forms of language to confuse. But yeah. regardless of that, um, I mean, why, why didn't you pick something else? Like, why, was it, was it there's some a connection to throwing knives or just because of the classic magic thing? Or was there, was there some more ingrained, like, well, I like this more, the way, project, the way it is? I mean... You know, it it, well, it, 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 it she doesn't use it personally, but anything else could have been used in that same accord, in my opinion. 
Well, I mean, yeah, a couple reasons. One, you're right. The, the, it's the whole magic motif, the whole stage performer would use throwing knives in their act kind of thing. So that would be what was in the trunk. But uh, in, a, in another sense, not in a story sense, but just in a practical writing sense, it was really about find, finding something that had a really good image. Uh, for one, a really good image, you know, dog boy holding a knife, like you see back there, that's a really strong image. You know, he's a little boy holding a knife as a yeah. guy creeps up on him, right? But in another sense, I knew it was a, a weapon that would be useful to a 13-year-old. A 13-year-old would have an idea of the repercussions, but they would probably still use it a little irresponsibly, which I thought was, you know, thematically what I was trying to do with the character being a kind of crappy superhero, but a 13-year-old good enough <laughs> superhero. 13-year-old good enough. Well, yeah, but that, I, th I thought that would be interesting. Well, that brings up kind of a point, because we mentioned earlier, and I'll spoil what it is, but we mentioned that there is a, you know, both practical magic or, you know, real-life magic, and then there's real magic at certain points. Mm -hmm. um, what inspired you at the, uh, you're closer to the end of the book, uh, to actually, or, or not closer to the end of the book, but essentially that idea, what inspired you to have, because ultimately you could have made this character more of a Batman-esque figure. I mean, you and I have talked a lot about superheroes. We've had a lot of discussions on certain things and so like that. So why – and it's not that like we didn't have already a good basis for a power or just yeah. that. Why did you feel the need to have – to give him essentially a certain power? Um, I won't say what power is because I don't think it mentions – Well, the you, you, you mean the main power that he gets uh, in Chapter 2? I, yeah, I mean the power. The, the you, okay, spoiler alert. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, you can you can spoil. Spoiler it. alert. Uh, if you haven't read the book, I apologize. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, mm -hmm. Why give him the flash forward power? Why give him the power to essentially predict time? Uh, yeah, and basically uh, he has the power to see a very limited amount into the immediate future. Yeah, like, and, like he's he's got he's got almost hero hero power. Like, 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 I guess it, mm -hmm. what's the other one that had that in heroes? What's that? Who is the who is the guy that had the power to see like quickly in the midi, in the immediate future? Uh, I forgot who had that power in Heroes. Oh, uh, well, did Peter Petrelli had the power to see? Yeah, like, Peter Petrelli did. Yeah. To the future, but yeah, yeah, Peter Petrelli did. <laughs> yeah, but how how else? Uh, from a sorry, I hit my microphone. Uh, but from a writer's <laughs> perspective, how else are you gonna? Logically explain a thirteen-year-old getting one over on See, all that's sorts what of I professional thought. criminals. That's what, that's what I thought too, and I figured that that's the only mm -hmm. way you could have done it. Mm -hmm. But I just was like, like, there's, I mean, because plus, plus uh, you know, he he gets the power from his dad, and I, I'm not going to say anything because there there are plans for you know a future story. Well, yeah, you but, you, but you, uh, there you are re the there are reasons his his dad had that very specific power to pass. Yeah, you left a couple things dangling at the end that were very purposely dangling, like, ah, here comes the yeah. comic book -y way of doing it. Um, but, like, because, I mean, ultimately, you're right. Like, how else we do it? And, and, and all these kids seem to have that kind of thing. I mean, you have yeah, and, your partner has spider seed, your spidey sense, or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing, the idea of, like, oh, something bad's happening. But it was it was such a weird thing. What I liked about, it, about the actual power itself um, and I'll word it this way, even though we're kind of in spoiler territory already. Um, I liked that when he used it for personal gain, it hurt him. Mm -hmm. Like that there was a, a physical reaction that was telling him, no, you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I really dug that uh, because it's such a – I mean, because ultimately that's the question you're on. If, if he knows this, if he can do this power at, at will, so to speak – why not use it for personal gain? Why not do something cool? Why not, you know, kiss the girl or do whatever? And there's a point where he does it for personal gain, and he, you know, he, he, he has a, a he's, his nose is bleeding, he has a mm -hmm. physical reaction, he almost passes out, and, and it, you know, and, and people think he's kind of weak, weak need, and it becomes apparent that, oh, okay, he can only use it for good, uh, and he has to use it for good, or he has to use it in situations where it, it almost comes... Natural, like, was that purpose? I mean, I wasn't personal, but what made you go force that kind of thing? Was it just so you, you wouldn't use it for evil, or was there something more to it than that? No, I, I mean, definitely, uh, it, it was from a thematic point to kind of, you know, teach <laughs> the character the right lesson uh, as it went on. But I also thought, you know, in uh, the Osbert character is really the one that kind of spurs him on to kind of yep. try and force it 
and you know get it, get the power to work without because initially it's more of just like an instinctual kind of like yeah oh you turn your head away when you hear see have a bad smell in your face or something like that uh it's more of something like that and osbert osbert is the one pushing him to you know test it and test it and test it and uh you know so, so one it's a thematic thing and two i just thought that osbert would be you know, him being of kind of a logical, scientific, uh, intelligent mind would want to kind of try and force the issue and see exactly what Dog Boy could do and try and, you know, see how best to use his abilities to help the uh, Guild of Thieves. For sure, for sure. We're almost up, up on the hour mark, and I, I think that this would be a, a good stop point once we get to the hour mark. There is another theme that kind of comes in the book, and, that, and I, I think that as much as we talk about superheroes, as much as we talk about a lot of these sort of, you know, villains and, and, and things like that, one of the other themes that comes up a lot is family and kind of what that means. Uh, obviously, in terms of, of Dog Boy, you know, he has his father's magic kit. Um, we have a very evil uncle uh, character. Uh, and we even have, like, some other things. Um, where did you draw that from? Was it from a personal kind of fam idea of family to you, or was there something? Was it just because you're like, well, every superhero that seems to have every superhero has something with their family, either their parents die or mm -hmm. their, their their uncle dies and and tells them, you know, the, the lasting quote they'll ever hear, which is, you know, uh, <laughs> it, it becomes the motif of the of the whole, you know, character. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, yeah, with the whole family thing, I, for, for one, I, it, it, like I said, the original story uh, was created in a time in my life when I was moving out to the big city on my own for the first time, away from family. <laughs> and so, you know, family was on my mind in the, when I was writing the original story. And then when I was rewriting it, you know, several years have passed. And, you, you, you know, personally, in my own life, I, I've, had, I've had a bit of a falling out with my own family. And I, but I, at the same time, over the court, at the same time I was having that falling out, I was also sort of rebuilding a new family and picking my family. And they, that, that's something that kind, kind of a lesson I wanted to leave, leave at the end of the story. If, if, you know, there's a big lesson for Dog Boy and for the reader and stuff like that. Uh, what, one of the big ones is that, uh, you know, your family is who, who you make it. And you can either choose to make your family good people or bad people and you know blood really doesn't have a lot to do with it it's more of a mindset it's more of uh how you, how you approach approach it and how you treat people versus how they treat you and stuff that family isn't defined by blood it's defined by people how you enter into a relationship with another yeah it's defined by people who love you and that kind of thing all right mm -hmm. well as our last and final question and all that crap now like all that all that <laughs> junk and stuff final question Okay. You've written a book, mm -hmm. which was originally a screenplay. Whew. Yeah. <laughs> well, two questions. One, when's the sequel coming out? Mm. Okay. Let's put a date uh, now. Let's put a date. Put a, put a hard put date. A date. <laughs> a date. Well, I, I'm, there won't be a sequel to the novel for probably at least a year. Okay. But the next, the next Dog Boy adventure will oh. be available before the end of the year. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. We, we, we've we already mm -hmm. already done that. Last final question. When the heck is this going to be a comic book? See, the thing about comic books <laughs> at, is, you know, you can get the, really like, nice I mean, drawings this, like this, this but they're so expensive. Tall as a comic, like, you know, and, and, and I didn't mention this, but this is like beat for beat. Like, I could see the frames in my head. Mm -hmm. And it was written in that way. It was like, yeah, a comic book here, a comic book. Like, why, why wasn't this like a trade paperback, Bill? Like, could, why, where, where was my, where was my, my six issue spread? I, I would love for it to be a comic <laughs> book. I would I, like when I, when I saw Paul's artwork back here that I have back here on the wall. I, like, my mind was blown. I was like, man, I wish I could afford to have him do you know, a hundred page graphic novel or whatever. Well, on well, Dog well but unfortunately, it's just you know. The, the economics of it don't work out yet. <laughs> well, let's kick this into the stratosphere, Bill. Let's get you enough money to get this drawn. Where the heck can people go and acquire this book? How, how, can, I, how can I say shut up and take my money, Bill? I want Dog Boy <laughs> to be a real comic. 
Well, I'll say, uh, you know, in my lower third, dogboyadventures.com, that's the main website. I do a weekly podcast where I put interviews like this and whatever else I feel like putting up related to the book up there. And there's also links to buy it on every platform imaginable, Kindle, Barnes & Noble, physical book, whatever. The physical book's really nice. I recommend it. No, I don't make any more off it, you know, but uh, if you want to go and buy it on Amazon, which is where, you know, with the charts and everything really helps out, uh, you can just go to bit.ly slash dog boy book and you'll land go. right on the page to buy it. So. Simple, simple as, as all it can be. And, and I recommend it, even if you're not a young adult audience, it's still a great book. If you are a young adult or know a couple ones that are into that kind of, that are, you know, of the right age appropriate for this thing. It is written well. There isn't any curse words. It does get near the end. I will war I will warn you. It does get a little graphic near the end, but a lot of it is is almost. Um, if I have to draw a parallel, uh, and if you read the end of Great Gatsby, and and you know how they didn't show anything of, of what happened in that in that book, it's kind of like that. Like there's never a point where they where where you have the gruesome description of whatever just happened. Uh, it's sort of left to your own imagination, which I think is always the better way of doing it. I would say that's a more, uh, that's actually the more terrifying way of doing it, to be honest, as a writer. Uh, Bill, thank you for, oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say, and it, it's dark thematically too, but it would pa pass through an obscenity filter just fine. Oh, yeah, so. yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's no more brutal than, let's say, your first issues of Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe different Spider-Man now and different Marvel comic thematic <laughs> now, but early thematic one, you know, your Golden Age comics, I'd say. It's no more darker than that. There, there are a little bit more, you know, more modern, obviously, things like that, but it's, it's, it's well age-appropriate, in my opinion, and definitely well worth a read if, if you're in this one. Bill, thank you for letting me, you know, host this whole thing and, and do this. Thank you for um, reading yeah. my book and asking me questions about it. That's... Of course, sir. I, 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 I would dream of nothing better to do this. Uh, of course, if you'd like to check out more of my things for some bizarre reason, after you check out Bill's stuff, of course, uh, just go to my network website, CosmicRadio.tv. There you'll find pretty much all the podcasts I do and any other things on the network, from things like Jump Point, to Retro Fun Time, to 8-Bit Life, to any of the weird kind of geeky sort of in-depth stuff. Especially if you like a lot of these in-depth interviews where I've, I've talked to people. I've had Bill on many times in my podcast, 8-Bit Life. Uh, I, I do a lot of different sort of stuff, so if you happen to like the style of things you've seen heard today in terms of interview style and, and all that kind of jazz, go check that out. Regardless of it, do read uh, Dog Boy and, and The Den of Thieves. Um, it is, like I said, it's well, well worth a read, and I didn't know what to get into. I had no idea what I was getting into reading it and everything else, and I, I definitely dug it for sure. So definitely go check it out. Uh, but until then, uh, Bill, thanks again for letting me do this. Thank you. Dog Boy, Den of Thieves by Bill Meeks. Available now on the Amazon Kindle, iBooks, at CreateSpace, or for the Barnes & Noble Nook. And find out more at dogboyadventures.com.